Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 145. I'd like to read verses 1 and 2. It says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. We would like to welcome you to the Abernet Christian Church this morning. Some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, tomorrow, the CWF will have their Christmas uh, party. They will have a gift exchange that's optional. So if you'd like to participate in that, we just ask that you bring a $20 gift. And then uh, those that want to participate will have their gift exchange. They always have a great time, and it's at 6 o'clock. And so if you're a lady, um, even if you haven't been a part of the CWF, you're welcome to come and to attend that. Um, youth group will meet Wednesday at 6 o'clock here at the church. Bible study will meet Thursday at 7. Next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we'll gather here at the church. We'll go Christmas caroling, and then we'll come back for soup supper following that. Um, elders meeting will be on the 15th of December at 6.30 here at the church. On the 19th, we're going to try to put together some kind of a small Christmas program. Not exactly sure what all that's going to entail yet, but we're going to try and do a little bit of something there on the 19th. And then um, Bethany has agreed to help me do a little bit of a program for Christmas Eve as well. So um, just some things that are a little farther out to put on the calendar there as well. Any other announcements that we want to mention at this time? Katie. I brought, well, some of you already know. I brought the family. We, I... We ju I just got it Friday after school, and I happened to check my email over the weekend, so we were able to get the tags made. Um, but we, it's a mom, a single mom with two kids. There's a 12-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl. I have all the cards back there. If we need more cards, there's a chance we could add some things that were on their list, but I have their, it covered their three needs, their three wants, and three things for the family as a whole. So if you have questions, but please make sure you sign next to the tag that you took, and we'll have them back on the 19th so that I can get them to the school in time for the family to pick them up before Christmas break. <clears throat> Sounds good. Any other announcements? Yes. Dan, I think we should have prayers for the victims and families of the shooting in Michigan. Any others? Yes. The Randy Ballerson family. Randy's got COVID. Okay. Any others? I think Shirley and Kenny Andrews could use their prayers also. Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we approach your throne this morning, it is our desire to lift you up and to praise you, for you are a great and a mighty and an awesome God. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we consider the world and that you have made and the universe that it is, resides in, we're just astounded at your power and your majesty and your greatness. And Heavenly Father, as we come together in your house this morning, we lift up to you those that are on our prayer list. Heavenly Father, those who need your very real and very special touch, we ask that you just be with Kenny and Shirley as they uh, recover from uh, the deer strike that they had. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you just be with Randy as he um, is recovering from COVID, that you just reach down and touch him and just strengthen his body and help him to mend and to heal and to recover. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you just be with each and every one that was affected by the shooting in Michigan. Lord, for um, those who are hurt, we just ask that for your healing. Heavenly Father, for those who have been affected emotionally and in so many other ways, we just ask for your healing for them as well, that you would just allow them to feel your presence, and that, Lord, somehow, some way, that you'd bring some good of it somehow. We just pray that you would just be with each and every one that's on our prayer list. That, Lord, you would just move and bring victory to your people. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 188. Let's stand as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. First, second, and final verse. Oh, come. 
second and the final verse. Sleep. 
meditation this morning, reading a passage entitled Stay Together, with scripture taken from Ephesians 4.3, where it says, Keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Dewberry Baptist Church split in the 1800s over a chicken leg. Various versions of the story exist, but the account told by a current member was that two men fought over the last drumstick at a church potluck. One man said God wanted him to have it. The other replied God didn't care, and he really wanted it. <coughs> the men became so furious that one moved a couple kilometers down the road and started Dewberry Baptist Church number two. Thankfully, the churches have settled their differences and everyone concedes the reason for their split was utterly ridiculous. Jesus agrees. The night before his death, Jesus prayed for his followers. May they be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me. Paul agrees. He urges us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, and these cannot be divided. We who weep for Christ's body broken for our sin must not tear apart his body, the church, with our anger, gossip, and cliques. Better to let ourselves be wronged than be guilty of the scandal of church division. Give the other guy the chicken leg and some pie too. This morning for joining our communion hymn is hymn 222. We'll sing the first, second, and stay on that fifth verse. communion table. Lord, that our thoughts might be turned to you and how you great, gave such a great sacrifice of your son going to the cross for the sins of the people. Lord, as we take of this cup today, let us remember the blood that was spilled so that Jesus cleanse our sins white as snow. And as we take of the bread, we remember how Jesus was beaten and scourged with a whip. And Lord, that he was badly beaten and hands pierced with nails and feet. Lord, such a great sacrifice for people that Jesus didn't even know. But he was willing to do it for the whole world for mankind's sin. Lord, let us remember him always in the things that we do, the things that we say. And as we go out into the community, let us spread the good word. We ask these things in your precious loving name. Amen.
Father God, as we come to this part of our service, we pause to reflect on the many, many, many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. Lord, you have been so very good to us in regards to family and friends and, Lord, uh, food for our table, shelter where we can stay warm. And, Lord, for each of those things, we are truly grateful and we thank you. As we reflect on the many blessings that you have given to us, we pause to give back a portion of that that you have so freely given. And as we do so, we ask for your blessing on both the gift and the giver. Help us now to use those gifts to reach out to our community and to our world with the love of Jesus to all who will listen. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. This morning, the message is entitled, What God Wants for Christmas. If you'll turn with me to Micah chapter 6, I'd like to read verses 6 through 8. And it says this, reading from the New International Version, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? There are only 19 days left until Christmas. And if you haven't begun your Christmas shopping, you might already be too late. <laughs> um, I, you know, am, I, I remember those, those shows where uh, the dad waits till the very last minute and he is on Christmas Eve going through the stores that are still open and trying to throw whatever he can find that's left into the shopping cart. Well, with the supply chain the way it is this year, <laughs> it might be that way 10 days before Christmas. I don't know. Um, giving presents is always a problem. If you love someone, you want to make sure you give them something that they really want. Ideally, you want to see that look of joyous surprise when they open the gift, and even before they say the word you know that it was perfect. You know, there's some people that um, are easy to buy for. My wife's pretty easy to buy for because um, she doesn't usually buy stuff on her own unless she really, really absolutely has to have it. And then I have a brother-in-law that is like super hard to buy for because anything that he wants... He just goes out and buys it. And so, you know, like when we would do the gift exchange, you're like, what in am I going to get this guy, right? Um, I remember on my side of the family, we would uh, put everybody's name into the hat, and then we would uh, draw out the name, and that would be the person that we would do a present for instead of buying presents for everybody, and one year, um, I got my nephew, Stephen. Stephen uh, loves technology. In fact, um, he works down in Texas now helping to translate the Bible into uh, languages that don't yet have it. And he loved the Christmas lights and stuff. And so for his Christmas present... I went online and I did a bunch of research and I built him this box 
that he could plug into the computer so it had all kinds of relays. Like I, like I can't remember if I put like 24 different relays and circuits, 12 or 24 different relays and circuits in it so that the computer could control each one of those circuits and he could like um, play music and then make the lights flash to whatever like pattern he wanted to create for that. So he could like do his own personal light show. When he opened that present, you'd have thought he, I'd given him like a gold nugget the size of a house or something. That's the kind of thing that you look for, right? When you want to give somebody that, that oh my goodness, I can't believe that you did this kind of thing. But that doesn't always happen. And, you know, as we look at the gifts, sometimes we don't always get the response that we're looking for. Um, that's why Walmart and Target and Best Buy and all the rest are going to be open the day after Christmas. Those stores will take back a huge amount of merchandise from people bringing back well-intentioned gifts that weren't quite perfect. It's sad, really. You work so hard to find just the right gift, and then it doesn't fit, or it isn't the right color, or it was broken in the box, or they already had one, or the design doesn't match what they already have. Worst of all, it wasn't what they really wanted. And that's the worst, to give somebody a gift that they don't really want. Nothing makes you feel worse. They unwrap the gift, and then there's this short pause, just a microsecond. But in that moment, you already know the truth. Why, it's beautiful, they say. But you can see the look in their eyes. You put on a brave front and try again. Do you really like it? Like it, I love it. But you aren't fooled. It's not what they wanted. And drop by drop, all the joy drains out of Christmas. I think we've all seen those ads that say, what do you give the man that has everything? Usually the answer is something exotic, like cologne made from poison ivy, or a three-volume history of Niagara. We all probably know at least one person like that, that they have everything you can think of, or at least if they don't have it, you couldn't afford to give it to them anyway. So you scratch your head and wonder, what can I give them this year? If I were going to give Jesus a gift for his birthday, what could I give him that he would appreciate? After all, he's the creator of all things, and the one who holds all things together. What do you give someone who not only has everything, but who actually made everything? Well, that's a tough question. Is there anything the Lord would like from me this year? What could I give him that would bring a smile to his face? Luckily, we don't have to answer, or have to wonder, rather, about the quest answer to those questions. The Lord left his wish list for everyone to read. After all, if you don't know what to give someone, you should ask them, well, what would you like? The answer is found in the little book of Micah. It's possible that you missed it. Maybe you didn't even know that there was a book of Micah. It's in that section of the Old Testament that we call the Minor Prophets, so-called because the books are short, not because their message is less important. Micah is the name of a book in the Bible. It's also the name of the person who wrote the book. God gave Micah a message for his generation. He wrote that message down so that the people wouldn't forget it. Micah lived approximately 700 years before Jesus' birth. He was a country boy from a little town of Moresheth, a few miles outside of Jerusalem. Scholars tell us that he lived about the same time as his fellow prophets Isaiah and Hosea. 
In fact, many think that he and Isaiah were good friends because parts of the books that they wrote sound very similar. A character sketch of Micah would yield the following words and phrases, blunt, direct, terse, plain spoken, no nonsense, a straight arrow kind of guy. He loved the common man and hated corrupt politicians. In fact, his book is basically a condemnation of religious and political leaders who used their position to take advantage of other people. Micah was a prophet of social reform. Three phrases describe the situation of Micah's day. First would be international tension. Israel was caught between three warring nations, Assyria, Egypt, and the Philistines. The greater threat came from the Assyrians, who had exacted tribute from Israel in exchange for peace. It led to a kind of national slavery. The second phrase would be religious corruption. Again and again, Micah railed against priests who took bribes and then said whatever people wanted to hear. It seems like all the leaders were in on the take. And then thirdly, moral chaos. This follows from the first two. It was every man or woman for themselves. The rich ripping off the poor, leaders taking bribes, and everyone cheating everyone else. The merchants couldn't be trusted. The leaders couldn't be trusted. And you couldn't be sure about the members of your own family. Almost sounds like today, doesn't it? If you look at those phrases, one thing is clear. Micah lived in a day not much different than ours. His book could have been written in 2021. In some ways, the message sounds as if the prophet had been reading the Chicago Tribune. So Micah wrote to a world facing huge problems. And he wrote condemning sin and rampant hypocrisy. Rampant amongst God's people. In no uncertain terms, he warned them of judgment to come. He pulled no punches. He took no prisoners. Dropped into the severe message from God is a delightful passage of scripture. The one that we opened with this morning. Although it is only three verses long, it tells us exactly what God wants from you for Christmas this year. First of all, we can see the wrong answer. And that's my first point. The wrong answer. Quality of service. Micah 6.6. 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come with him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? The people have heard Micah's words of warning, and now they want to know, what does God want from us? Their first answer deals with the quality of sacrifice. A yearling calf was a one-year-old calf that was considered the prime age for sacrifice. Perhaps God will be pleased if we give him the very, very best that we have. But the answer is no. Maybe it's the quantity of sacrifice. Maybe if it's not the very, very best, maybe it's just he wants a lot of sacrifice. I got a cough here, just a second. <coughs> maybe it's the quantity of sacrifice. Micah 6 7, the first part, says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? If it's not quality that he wants, then perhaps it's quantity. The idea is to impress God. 
by offering a thousand rams at a time and then creating a river of oil flowing through the streets. Surely, that would make God happy. The idea is that an extravagant sacrifice would convince God of their sincerity. But again, the answer is no. Well, then maybe what God wants is my ultimate sacrifice. And the second part of verse 7 brings that out. Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This is an immoral suggestion. Child sacrifice was forbidden by God, yet practiced by pagan people around Israel. The Canaanite people worship Moloch and the Ashereth. And um, the Ashereth was a fertility goddess. And so you can imagine the kind of activities that were involved in the worship of the Ashereth. And many times the children that were born out of that activity would be sacrificed back to Asherah and buried underneath the Asherah pole. It's part of the reason that God called for the destruction of the Canaanite people when the Israelites took possession of the land. Child sacrifice was something that was abhorrent to God. The people are suggesting that maybe if they offer their firstborn sons, the Lord would be pleased and forgive their sins. But once again, the answer is no. You've got the picture, don't you? This is, let's make a deal religion. Whatever you want, Lord, we'll do it. You name the price, we'll meet it. They actually thought God would trade forgiveness for sacrifice. In essence, they thought God could be bought just like one of their religious leaders. Just like one of their political leaders. The custom of trying to buy those who were over them had become so prevalent that the idea in the back of their mind was somehow, somehow maybe I can buy God's favor too. But the answer is no. It's so typical of us. We often try to do the same thing. We say, Lord, I'll do anything you want. You just name the price. You want a missionary? I'm ready to go. You want me to be married or to stay single? I'm your man. Lord, I'll be a preacher or a pastor. I'll be a deacon or an elder. I'll pray every day. I'll read my Bible. Whatever you want from me, Lord, that's what I'll do. I really mean it, Lord. Now, there's nothing wrong with those sentiments. They're good and they're noble and they're proper. And God is pleased when we offer ourselves to him. So what's wrong? Those answers only deal with the outside. What God really wants is your heart. I'd venture to say that every one of us has at one point or another tried to make a deal with God. If we're honest, someone that we love has gotten terribly ill. Maybe somebody that we care about was in a horrible car accident. And we said, God, if you will heal 
so-and-so. I'll do whatever you want. God, if you'll answer this prayer, I promise I won't ever do it again. If you get me out of this jam, I'll never, ever get back into it again. But you see, God, what he really wants is our heart. From a parent's perspective, do you want your child's obedience because they're afraid that you're going to spank them? Or do you want them to obey you because they love you? Why would God be any different? You see, the idea that sometimes we have is that I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway, but I'll just ask God to forgive me. That's the wrong attitude. Sacrifice was intended to show how sorry we were on the inside. It was an outward action to show what's going on inside. Not just some way to try to appease an angry God. God rejected every offer made by the Israelites because they had completely missed the point. They wanted to make a deal, and what God wanted was their hearts. So let's look at the right answer. That's point number two. Let's look at the right answer. This verse has been called the heart of the Old Testament religion, and the greatest verse in all the Old Testament. It sums up what God really wants from you and from me. This is the kind of verse... You ought to commit to memory. Write it out on a card and put it in your mirror so that you can look it up every day. It tells us exactly what God looks for in your life. It says this. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. With your God. The first part of that is to act justly. To act justly. Micah 6 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly. To do what is right. The Hebrew word is mishpat. Often in the Old Testament, the word is applied to God's own character. God is just. He is absolutely fair and righteous in his dealings. He gives each person exactly what they deserve. Justice means treating people right because you know God. In the Bible, this concept is applied in some very concrete ways. Caring for the poor, remembering the widows and the orphans, not plowing the corners of your field so the hungry could get food, speaking the truth, paying a fair wage, having honest scales, not cheating, no extortion, and refusing to take advantage of the less fortunate. Now, as you looked at that list that I just read, maybe you think that it's interesting that God instructed the Israelite people to plant the whole field, but to only harvest it in a circle. You see, that was God's welfare program. So when they got ready to harvest the crops, there were two provisions that God incorporated 
to make sure that the poor, the homeless, the widows uh, could have food for their table. The first was that they were to harvest the field in a circle and leave the corners so that those who were needy could come and harvest the corners and have food to eat. The second provision that God made was that as you're harvesting, if you drop part of your harvest as you're threshing it, you're to leave it to lay. What I find interesting in that is that God provided for those who are needy, but he didn't just give it to them. He didn't bring them their food as they sat on the couch. They had to go harvest it. It's interesting that part of the problem that we're having in our economy is because people who quit work don't want to go back to work. And they'd rather sit on their couch and watch TV and collect a check than to actually earn their income. God's method for welfare meant that you had to get up off your chair and go find the food that you were going to eat. He provided it, but you had to go get it. For us at Christmas time, justice certainly means doing right to the less fortunate because we know God. You see, God intends for us to be his hands and his feet. We are Jesus to the people that we come in contact with. The second um, thing that he wants from us is mercy. Micah 6.8 says, and to love mercy, to love mercy. This speaks of the way that we treat others. The Hebrew word is hesed, which means loyal love or patient love. It's the word sometimes translated, his mercy endures forever. It means loving the unlovely, even though they don't love you back. It speaks to our obligation to care for people who don't care for us in return. Here's a simple definition of mercy. Doing unto others as God has done unto you. In just a few days, 2021 will be history. Think back across, across the last 12 months. How has God blessed you this year? Has God blessed you? Then bless others. Has God forgiven you? Then forgive others. Has God lifted you up when you were down? Then lift up others when they're down. Has God overlooked your faults? Then overlook the faults of others. The word translated mercy is elsewhere translated as lovely or beautiful. Here's a quality that will make you beautiful to others. I call this hope for the homely. Show mercy and people will think you're beautiful. We've all seen people on street corners holding up signs asking for money. They don't care how much money I have, only that I share some of that money with them. In the same way, the world doesn't care how much love I have, only that I share it with them. How many people do I know that hold a spiritual sign that says, Godless? Need his love and forgiveness. Please help. Most every time, I pretend that I don't see that sign or the need. I don't have the time or the money or the solution or some other excuse. I can't attract non-Christians to me when I refuse to share God's love with my hurting coworker, my Muslim acquaintance, my widowed neighbor. Lord, this holiday season, help me to openly share my love and my faith to those who need it around me. We need mercy at Christmas time. If God has been merciful to you this year, be merciful to those who are around you. And then finally, humility. Humility. 
Micah, the last part of verse 6, 8 says, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The word humbly comes from the Hebrew word that means modestly or carefully. It speaks of an attitude that is the opposite of pride. What is humility? It's having a right view of yourself because you have a right view of God. Humility does not mean saying, I am a nothing, I'm a worm, I'm useless. That's not humility, that's self-pity, which is really another form of pride. And what is pride? It's having too large a view of yourself because you have too small a view of God. When your God is big, you'll be small, and pride will be impossible. Let's be honest. Pride is a huge problem in our society today. And even sometimes this idea of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, we're so proud that we won't ask God for help, even when we need it. Humility is God has made me and I belong to him. Every good thing I have in life is a gift from the Almighty. Some have more, some have less. It doesn't matter. I thank God for what I have and I'm going to do the best that I can with what God has given me and I'm going to leave the outcome to him. Paul said it a little differently. He says, I have known um, excess and I have known great need. But I have learned in all things therewith to be content. If we live that way, it will save us so much trouble. We won't get into a power game at work or live in the rat race or sell our convictions to get ahead. We won't get angry at the silly comments people make. Humility enables us to be who we are in Christ, and we don't have to worry about what other people think. You know, part of our perspective should be to realize that everything that we see around us is temporary. The things that we own, we're just caretakers of. Someday they'll belong to somebody else. That this world is really not our home. But that our home is with Jesus in heaven. And if we can keep that in the forefront of our mind. Then a lot of things that seem so important won't be so important at all. I remember when we were really little, mom would say, let's play a game. Let's see who can be the quietest. And that works about this long, right? Because eventually, as a, as a kid, you realize that that's not a game that you want to play, right? So maybe the first times when you're really little, you, you tried to be really quiet and sit still. But then you get to the point where when somebody says, well, let's see who can be the quietest. You say, I lose, right? <laughs> because you know it's a game that you don't want to play. The world is trying to get us to play a game. A game that says the person with the most toys wins. We need to be able to say like that child, I lose. Doesn't matter. Because it's all God's anyway. <clears throat> what does God want from us this year at Christmas time? Justice, mercy, and humility. 
Rightly understood, those three words form the sum total of your Christian duty. If you have those things, God will be pleased. If you don't, nothing else makes much difference. Which brings us back to Micah. Why didn't God accept all their sacrifices? Why did he turn them down? Because they offered him everything except the one thing that he wanted. Their hearts. The religion God approves is the religion of the heart. Outward religion is useless unless the heart belongs to God. He wants the real you. The person on the inside. You can fake a lot of religious activity, but the heart doesn't lie. What does God want from me at Christmas time? And every other day as well, justice, mercy, and humility. These are matters of the heart. This is why Jesus came. Matthew says he, came, he will proclaim justice to the nations. When Mary sang of Jesus' birth, she said, His mercy extends to those who fear him. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble in Luke chapter 1, verse 50 and 52. This is the heart of the gospel, what God requires. He first gave to us. He came to establish justice. He came to show mercy. He came to lift up the humble. Do you have room? In Luke 2, 7, it says she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths, strips of cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the end. You know, there are many contemporary excuses that the innkeeper might give today. I'm sorry, it's dinner time. Don't interrupt me. Totally frazzled, can't handle more company. Sorry, Christmas pageant tonight. God bless you. Bye. Not now. I'm listening for tonight's lotto numbers. We're all gived out. Can't afford to put up company. Sorry. Can't. At this point, I don't know which end is up. After 2,000 years, Jesus still knocks at the door of your heart. Will you make room for him this year? He wants your heart. Perhaps you've heard these words by Christina Rossetti. What will you give Jesus this year? What shall I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I'd give him a lamb. If I were a wise man, I'd do my part. What shall I give him? I'll give him my heart. Have you done that? Have you given him your heart? No decision is more important. No one else can make it for you. If you're not ready, then there's nothing I can do or say to compel you to do it. But if you are, now is the time. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn is hymn number 408. Let's stand as we sing the first and the fourth verse. 408.
Father God, as we once more come before your throne, I just pray that you would just help us to give you our heart this Christmas season. That, Heavenly Father, that we would exhibit justice and mercy. And that, Heavenly Father, we would be the people that you've called us to be. Watch over us now. Keep us safe. Help us to be witnesses for you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.